There are a number of CRISPR applications that require precise edits. So we're not just talking about knocking out and, and destroying and disrupting uh, the coding region of a gene or uh, the, the important parts of a gene regulatory element. So there are situations where you want to integrate transgenes or, or, or short sequences like um, epitope tags so these are very specific sequences and you will want to put them in specific places. Um, also, if you're trying to correct human genetic disorders, you're wanting to make very specific single, double or triple base changes um, and you don't want random mutagenesis to occur. And a key thing to point out is if you look at the NCBI ClinVar database and, and download the 75,000 or so um, human disease variants that are out there, the vast majority of them are very small in length. So a lot of them are, so 30% of them are tr transition point mutations, so single DNA-based changes. Um, a transition mutation, just, just for reference, is where you've swapped a pyrimidine for a pyrimidine base. So for example, an A for a T, a T for an A, or a G for a C, or C for a G. A transversion point mutation occurs in about 20% of human genetic disease, and that involves an exchange of a pyrimidine for a purine base or vice versa. So, for example, uh, an A um, for a T or a G for an A. <laughs> um, 26%. 26% of human genetic diseases um, involve um, short deletions and then there are duplications and obviously then you've got larger changes such as copy number changes and large insertions and deletions. When you look at the deletions and duplications and insertions, uh, the vast majority of them are less than 25 bases in length. So most human disease associated mutations are very short in length. And so if you've got a method to make small, precise edits, potentially um, you could use that to correct the majority of human genetic disorders. So how do we make precise edits with CRISPR? So the first option, um, and one that uh, most groups are using to date, is to use homology-directed repair of the cell. So this involves creating a double-strand break, and obviously you can do very large insertions when you use homology-directed repair, but you can make small edits as well. The second option is to use a, a, a new method called base editing. We're using an enzyme to swap bases over. Uh, the advantage of that is that there's no DNA break created. Uh, and then the third option is to use a brand new method which came out at the end of 2019. Um, so it's only a couple of months old. And it's called prime editing. And there there's no uh, um, double strand DNA breaks created. Uh, and it is unlike all the other approaches, it's capable of, of uh, making all kinds of edit edits of less than 80 bases in length, but at a very high efficiency and a very high specificity. So I should take you through each of these three. So as I mentioned in the, in the overview at the beginning, uh, homology directed repair uh, requires a donor DNA template. And so for the in the case of a large alteration like inserting a transgene, that's often a plasmid or a viral vector with your transgene flanked by quite long homology arms of 750 bases or more. If you wanted to make point mutations or, or very small edits, then um, your HDR experiment would involve a single stranded DNA donor template, so just an oligonucleotide, where the homology arms are just 40 bases in length. So both of these systems work, and you can get um, precise editing of a target, 
the problem is is that error prone non homologous end joining repair confounds these HDR strategies because it is the most dominant um, repair pathway for the double strand brakes that you create. So the majority of cells that you that you create after doing an HDR experiment will be random mutants. And in the background is a minority of accurate HDR corrections. And a lot of your correct HDR cells will be correct on one allele and randomly mutated on another. So this can be extremely frustrating and requires a lot of work to filter through each of these cell clones that you will make to find your, your cells with the edits that you're interested in. So it's important again to look right back at the beginning where I, I mentioned that non-homologous end joining occurs throughout the cell cycle, but is, is obviously very high in G1 and S phase, whereas HDR occurs primarily in, in G2. Um, so one trick that can be used um, with great effect um, is to make a fusion of Cas9 with part of a protein called geminin. Geminin is a protein that is cell cycle regulated. It's transcription and expression is not cell cycle regulated so it's expressed throughout the cell cycle but it is targeted for degradation um, by the proteasome um, but in G2 geminin becomes phosphorylated and this domain that gets targeted for degradation is now resistant and so geminin can then accumulate and function in G2 and M phase so this is a post-translational regulation of uh, cell cycle regulation of geminin. So you can take that domain of geminin that gets targeted for degradation but is, is protected by phosphorylation and stick that onto Cas9. And this now means that the Cas9 geminin fusion, again, is, is expressed throughout the cell cycle but gets degraded, can't function, apart from in G2 when um, it becomes phospho phosphorylated and protected. So when you use this, you get a big shift in the bias of HDR experiments towards HDR events. Non-homologous end joining still happens, but now perhaps is a minority event. So now it may be two-thirds HDR and one-third non-homologous end joining. So this is a very powerful um, modification to HDR strategies. Um, so this is just um, showing an example uh, from one recent paper of researchers who are very good at HDR, and these are the kinds of outcomes that you might get. Um, so here they're um, targeting a variety of genes uh, with single base changes, um, or, or yeah, I think yeah, or, or here's a, a triple base insertion. So different HDR edits. And in blue bars, you can see this is a percentage of cells that have got their HDR edits in them. And in gray are the percentage of, well, that's the percentage of alleles that have got random insertions and deletions on them because of non-homologous end joining. So this shows the extent of the problem. So base editing uh, is an approach where you can make very small changes, often just to individual bases, uh, using an enzyme that will exchange, uh, that will modify the DNA base, and when it's replicated, it will lead to that, 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 that sequence being changed. So in this case, they're using a fusion of Cas9, and often they're using the Nikkei's mutant D10A, which I'll um, describe in a minute as to why they do that. Um, but they, they use Cas9 um, fused to... Um, a deaminase, and there are different deaminases out there. So, for example, there's AID and there's APOBEC. And what these deaminases, or ABC7, and what these deaminases do is deaminate, for example, an adenosine base and convert it to an inosine base. When inosine is replicated, it gets uh, uh, replicated as a guanosine base. So what you end up with here then is an A to G change. Alternatively, you could deaminate a cytosine base to a DU, and that gets replicated as uh, a T, so then you get a C to T change. They use the D10A nickase 
and they're very clever about the design of, of which strand uh, they put their guide RNA on. And this is all to make sure that um, only the base edits on the strand that they're interested in get incorporated because nick repair um, occurs on the non-edited um, strand. Um, so nick repair doesn't create obviously any mutations by itself but it's been used to bias how the cell either uses the edited or the or the non-edited strand. Um, so the advantage of this approach is here using an enzyme. So the, the percentage of base editing is very high indeed. Um, um, I guess a, a key disadvantage is that depending on the sequence that you're targeting, it may not be possible just to edit one base only. It might, so for example, we're making a specific A to G change. There may be other A bases locally that will get converted to a G as well. And so we'll get other edits that we did not intend. So, so it does very much depend on the target as to how, how useful uh, this base editing is. But in, in some situations, it's very, very powerful indeed. There's also a risk that this base editor uh, will uh, modify bases at off-target sites and that those will be quite hard to hard to discover. So I'm going to end up with talking about prime editing. Um, prime editing is an incredibly powerful approach uh, that uh, uses a, a modified CRISPR system but there are no double strand breaks re uh, created. So we're not reliant on host double strand break repair. Um, it uses a Cas9 nickase to uh, locate this uh, prime editing enzyme to your target site uh, and to prime the editing. The intended edit is carried on a guide RNA template and a reverse transcriptase is used to copy that guide RNA template onto your target um, and creates this edited strand and then that edited strand is then incorporated into your target. So I shall take you through this in detail. So the prime editor again involves a Cas9, a guide RNA and your target as before but there are three key changes from conventional CRISPR. So firstly, they're using the H840A NICase of Cas9. So if this NICs at off targets, it'll create a NIC, but those won't lead to mutations. And the NIC at the on target by itself, again, won't lead to any change either. That in itself is just an entry point. As a reminder, the H840A nickase nicks the uh, non-target strand or the PAM strand. And so it will nick here at this very specific location, three bases away from the PAM. The H840A nickase is fused to a mutant version of the MMLV reverse transcriptase domain. This reverse transcriptase is uh, very well used in molecular biology. It's the one used in reverse transcription reactions when making cDNAs in, in molecular biology labs. Um, it's something that's been studied intensely. There are lots of mutations of it have been made to look at its performance. And so the mutant that they're using of, of the reverse transcriptase here, um, they've selected for one that functions very well um, in this particular um, architecture here. Thirdly, the guide RNA, which is the same as before, so normal guide RNA, except that now it's much longer, so it's a prime editing guide RNA or PEG RNA, and this three prime extension carries the template um, for the change that you want to make to your genomic target. So how does this work? So as a reminder, your all CRISPR target sites consist of a PAM sequence in the genomic DNA next to 20 bases 
that match the protospacer in the guide RNA. And Cas9 cuts three bases away from the PAM. In this case, it's just a nick, and the nick's occurring on the PAM strand. And that first base after there, we call plus one. And what the prime editor can do is, is change any sequence after this point. So all the sequence here, including the PAM, is susceptible to the prime editing. So the reaction occurs as follows. The first step is the nicking of or binding to the genomic target, opening up of the strands, and then nicking of the PAM strand. So what you end up with is a um, three prime flap here of your genomic target. And it is pairs up with your PEG RNA. So the, the very end of the PEG RNA, that three prime end, um, pairs up with your protospacer target. And generally, this primer binding site is 12 bases long. So again, you know what this sequence is. It's your protospacer um, from the cut site onwards. Those 12 bases are placed at the end of the PEG RNA. So all reverse transcription reactions require a primer of some kind. And in this case, this three prime um, overhang here is effectively a primer for five prime to three prime reverse transcription. So now in the next step, reverse transcriptase adds on the edit. And the edit just might be a single base insertion or deletion, doesn't matter what it is. Here is this template. So in this case, I've shown a three base change in red. So the original sequence in blue and black, the three base change in red. So it fills in that three base change and then a short sequence that matches the rest of your genomic target, which you want to be to stay the same. So the, the other side of your edit. So this is the non-edited sequence. And then a key thing is the reverse transcriptase cannot go any further into the PEG RNA because it's bound up by Cas9. So uh, the reverse transcriptase doesn't copy a guide RNA sequence. Um, into your genomic target. It only copies in what you've intended um, in your edited region here. So it fills that in. And then that's it. That's all this enzyme does. So it binds, opens, nicks, primes, and fills in. And that's all it's doing. So now we're hoping for the cell to incorporate this edited strand over the non-edited strand. So we have a three prime flap containing the edit in red. And three prime single strand ends are, are relatively stable uh, in the genome. Uh, there are no enzymes that will chew three prime to five prime. Um, so this three, three prime flap is there and the nick is there. Now there is going to be some breathing. This nick creates instability in this duplex. So these bases will unzip uh, at some to, to some level. And so there will be some equilibrium between the three prime flap and the five prime flap. Now this will be the most dominant form. Uh, this won't happen very often. But when it does, this five prime flap is now available for digestion. There are many enzymes that choose single standard DNA five prime to three prime. There are many enzymes that recognize five prime flaps and just cut the flap off. So the idea is that host enzymes will excise this five prime flap and your three prime flap, your edited flap will now come on in and hybridize through the bases that you've kept the same. But now you'll have a mismatch, a mismatch between your edit um, and the original non-edited sequence. So you've got a 50-50 chance of the cell when repairing that mismatch of incorporating your edit. Now the clever thing in the prime editing is that they um, have used a second guide RNA, but now it's a conventional guide RNA. It doesn't have this three prime extension on. So it's a second guide RNA to target your same prime editor enzyme to nick 
the non-edited strand. Okay, so this guide RNA hopefully is going to nick after the prime editing's happened. If it nicks before the prime editing's happened, nothing really is going to happen. The nick gets filled in. It's fine. So some of the time, this nick is going to happen after the prime edit. When it does, the the, the it's previously been found that um, by adding a nick into a mismatch sequence, so this was a, a um, why it's used in the, the the base editing system, as I've just mentioned before, is it biases the the repair of this mismatch to remove this strand and retain the edited strand. So if you nick the non-edited strand, you will lose the non-edited sequence and retain your edit. Okay. So uh, in the best form of prime editing, there are two guide RNAs. One of them is delivering your edit um, via reverse transcription. And the second guide RNA is biasing the repair of the edit towards your edited sequence. Um, and so you don't end up going back to your original sequence. So this is data um, from this prime editing paper. So as I've shown you before, these are the kinds of ratios of specific edits you get from uh, homology directed repair using single strand oligos. Um, so quite low levels of precise edits and high levels of, of background uh, non-homologous end joining. When you use the prime editor, you often get around 50% of your cells contain your precise edit, and it is precise. Uh, there's no, no indels associated with it. Um, when the prime edit goes in and there's a very low background of indels associated with mismatch repair that 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 hasn't been accurate <coughs> uh, that occur at your target and depending on how you design um, that um, second guide RNA to cut your target strand if you can design that towards your original target then um, um, and you can refer to the paper for this then this background goes down even lower. So prime editing is a, is a, a huge breakthrough in the CRISPR field. Um, it's got broad application um, because it's more uh, efficient than conventional CRISPR for creating precision edits. Uh, and it's got a very low uh, level of error as it currently stands. And, and obviously it's, people are going to work on this and probably optimize it even more. A key thing is it can mediate all four transition point mutations and all eight transversion point mutations um, and base editing the enzymatic base editing i talked about before cannot do that it can only do transition mutations um, it's been possible so far to insert up to 45 bases uh, using prime editing so adding epitope tags onto the ends of genes and also they've been able to delete up to 80 bases with prime editing and uh, actually, I don't think they've sort of discovered what the limit of it is yet. Um, so on paper, this can correct um, around 90% of, of, of human pathogenic genetic variants in principle. So um, it's very, very exciting for everybody. So in summary, I've told you about ZFNs and talons and showed you that nucleases can stimulate um, editing of uh, genomes in living cells via host uh, double-strand DNA break repair. ZFNs and talons are most useful when small proteins are required, so when delivery to primary tissues is difficult. Um, but for most applications, CRISPR is far easier, faster, and widely applicable. And conventional CRISPR remains the choice for gene knockouts and performing screens. But now CRISPR can be performed with high specificity um, and prime editing is probably the best choice for the precision editing of genomes. Thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments below what you thought of it. Um, please give us a like and certainly think of subscribing. And we've got a lot more content on this channel, which you can see uh, in the playlists coming up. Thanks.